Okay, so in, in part three of um, this week's content, I want to um, just talk a little bit about some other things to consider here, particularly around the notion that um, things like riots are often associated with gangs. And secondly, I'm going to talk a little bit about how class can help us think about what happens in the reaction to things like uh, riots. So um, very quickly, when this, this happened in, in, in England, um, the, you know, the usual moral panic in the mainstream media was happening, that kind of uh, process that I've talked about before, uh, and social commentators come out and start analysing the historical, political and, and social causes of the riot. Many, many of the politicians, the conservative politicians in particular, started to place blame on what they called gangs. And I'm doing that in inverted commas because um, it's very dubious in terms of the, whether that blame can actually be attributed to, um, in any reality, really. This saw the rise of various um, uh, you know, policies and um, uh, community endeavours to try and do something about this. There was the notion of hug or hoodie, um, Again, have a look at the Guardian website to look at that. Others were talking about what happened was just criminality, pure and simple. Um, so if you want to look at the wider um, aspects of this, I would look at, um, recommend uh, Imogen Tyler's book, Revolting Subjects, where she talks across uh, an array of figures, the Chav, the, the rioter, uh, the single mother and others, and talks about the way that those in poverty are used as kind of scapegoats for wider social and political inequalities. So very quickly, for some reason, um, you know, politicians in particular start blaming gangs for what's going on. Um, and so there's a quote there from um, David Cameron, the then UK Prime Minister, you know, at the heart of all the violence sits the issues of street gangs, mostly comprised of young boys, mainly dysfunctional homes, they earn money through crime, drugs, bound together by imposed loyalty to an authoritarian gang leader, they have blighted life on the estates with gang and gang murders and unprovoked attacks etc etc <clears throat> now what happened here very quickly was shown that that to those statements that what was happening in the riots was about gang behavior was quickly shown to be absurd so initially they claimed there was 28 percent of those people arrested were members of so-called gangs and they revised down to 19 and then by the end it was 13 so again the, the notion of kind of this was some kind of gang crime very quickly was downplayed now, in many ways, same old, same old, but like, you know, what we need to ask here is why do people in powerful positions want to invoke the gang all the time when things like this happen? And one of the answers to that is that, you know, if it's, if you can't kind of scapegoat it to particular already kind of sensationalized criminal forms of behavior, maybe it's, and maybe when the, you know, it seems that 87% of people involved in the riots had nothing to do with gangs and were probably just um, throughout most of their day-to-day -day lives everyday citizens. It's difficult to kind of say that there's nothing really wrong with the structures of society if things like this happen. So the kind of end point of the moral panic analysis here is the scapegoating of blame here towards gangs is doing specific political work. It's trying to kind of in many ways um, hide, you know, and individualise blame um, you know, hide the fact that rising unemployment, entrenched, um, an entrenched long-term unemployment, rising casualisation and precarity, um, you know, the, the new category of the working poor, um, where people that have full-time jobs now still aren't, um, you know, earning above the poverty line. Um, it, this kind of ideological work of, you know, blaming particular groups tends to play the role of trying to um, pathologise social problems as individual issues rather than kind of, you know, social political problems that, you know, if policies were changed, they may actually be fixed. So the, so the, the reading this week is, uh, is from Imogen Tyler, um, and she, I think, does a really excellent analysis of the ways that um, class is used um, in, in forms of victim blaming, scapegoating, and moral pathologizing. And this is particularly relates to the, to the idea of the underclass. Now, within class theory, the underclass is very controversial and most class theorists don't, don't really see it as a legitimate form of class or a class category. Um, it, again, it tends to be used to objectify, to make people abject, and to ram home workfare policies. Um, now, workfare is the idea, the increasing idea that um, 
rather than welfare being uh, money paid to the unemployed to support them while they look for a job. Workfare is the idea that they actually need to work for free, really, you know, do things like work for the dole and stuff like that to get that money um, and to get that support. Much of the research around workfare shows that very, very, you know, very, very little opportunity for people that are in it to actually then get real jobs. Um, it very rarely leads to being able to get, you know, solid um, employment. What also echoes here, and Tyler doesn't make this point, but I'm just pointing out here that this kind of speaks to the notions of disaster capitalism as well. So if you're interested in that, look at Naomi Klein's book on disaster capitalism. And this kind of goes back to the idea that um, neoliberal economics is really good at taking advantage out of disasters, particularly environmental disasters, but also things like riots where um, after things like this happen, there's often a real push to gentrify those areas. And, you know, obviously big money can be made um, when that happens. So Tyler's work in particular shows how the notion of the underclass is used as a form of symbolic violence um, to carry out the work of kind of those conservative moral panic discourses that I've been talking about. And she, I think, really interestingly breaks it down through some um, excellent um, concepts. The idea of penal pornography that comes from Loic Waquant, uh, the notion of stigmatisation that seems to be increasingly used by governments to push through um, their policies, through the notion of scum semiotics, the kind of the idea that the notion of the chav um, is used symbolically to, again, um, do that kind of stigmatisation, and the culturalisation of inequalities. And again, what that means here is rather than thinking about inequality and the ever-increasing rise of it at the moment in Western societies as being the result of economics, you know, actual economic decisions, the culturalisation of it seems to mean that, you know, inequality here becomes a moral thing. The people that are kind of lower in the hierarchy are seen as being immoral, not making the right choices, having bad taste and all that kind of stuff. Um, so here, Tyler formulates what happens around these riots, and these riots themselves are an expression of class struggle. Um, they're the kind of, you know, the, the bottom of the working class in Marxist terms, the most disadvantaged carrying out one of the few ways that they can um, rebel against this kind of ever-increasing oppressive um, regime that they feel that they're living under. Um, in my own work, I've talked about kind of a, also a sociological comparison of um, the ways that different forms of, um, you know, young people taking in the streets need to be thought of through the lens of class analysis as well. So within youth studies, there's a... Um, there's a kind of a notion of youth as class that one of the ways to think about young people as is, is to think about them as a whole group and this particularly works in kind of thinking about generations you know it seems to be that the current generations are the first generations that are going to be more impoverished than their parents um, so in terms of kind of broader political economic formations the youth as class kind of um, analysis can help us understand you know the history and the political and econ economy of what's going on but in terms of the politics of it, it's not as helpful in terms of what's going on um, within that youth as class. Um, and so in 2010, in, in the UK, there was you know, huge um, rallies on the streets, um, and some of them turned quite violent. But the way that they tended to be um, reported in the media was this was kind of, in many ways, legitimate. It was middle class people on the streets, you know, protesting over increased fees and what this would be in, uh, mean about higher education and opportunities. So they were seen as a more legitimate form of protest in that sense. Um, and while they had absolutely no real effect on the fee debate, um, in terms of the politics around this, it seemed that political groups were very anxious around what it meant in terms of the middle class vote um, for the next election. We can contrast this to, you know, in terms of the reaction that I was just talking about in terms of the, the, the London riots. Here you have a much more disadvantaged group you know, getting out onto the streets. Obviously there was damage and violence, but instantly, rather than any kind of broader social understanding of the events that was um, um, deemed legitimate for the middle class education protests, um, you know, it's instantly about this kind of revolting underclass. So in terms of the class analysis and the idea that youth as class, if they could act as a class together, could, you know, maybe um, uh, uh, promote or engender some kinds of um, emancipatory social change. Um, I would argue that this is pretty unlikely that there's those groups of people, you know, fairly privileged middle class young people and really disadvantaged young people 
are very unlikely to see the similarities between their positions because, let's face it, they're not that similar. But they're even less likely to see that, you know, the, the cause of a system, you know, neoliberal capitalism that's causing their discontent, um, they're very unlikely to see that they have a common plight to fight against there, basically based on their um, class inequalities and the distinctions between them. What this also relates to is the kind of increasing criminalisation of protest. Protest itself now, um, you know, going out on the streets and holding a banner is increasingly criminalised. What happens now is often that, like, if there's an event where there's a, a prediction that there's going to be protests, that they'll make protesting illegal, except if you do it in a particular place at a particular time. Now, obviously, this kind of makes the very idea of um, public dissent difficult, criminalised, and it's obviously an effort to stop people doing it. In many ways, you would think that this would actually lead to more rights if the legitimate forms of dissent are increasingly criminalised as well. This speaks to the notion of public, the privatisation of public space, um, where there's more and more regulations of space and less and less things allowed to do in them. So you'll definitely see this any time now that um, you know there's summits of global leaders, whole kind of sections of cities are fenced off and there'll be armed guards around it. Um, and this is you know a relatively new thing that's happened over the past ten years, twenty years really. So if, again, if you're interested in the criminalisation of the protests and the privatisation of public space. Um, have a look at the work of Mark Davis, City of Courts, a, an incredible book written about LA in the 90s. Henry Giraud's book about youth in revolt. Uh, Giraud's an, an excellent, really angered writer about um, the way young people are treated in, in America in particular. And David Graeber's work on the Democracy Pro Project. Graeber is a very well-known um, professor of anthropology and he was also heavily involved in the Occupy movement. Um, he was the one that kind of coined the phrase, you know, the 1% and the 99%. Okay, so to kind of sum up this week's material, um, you know, so from a sociological point of view, um, riots can be read in a number of different ways. Um, I think, uh, the, you know, as an expression of anger, enemy, alienation, exploitation, you know, the constant experience of symbolic violence and real violence by the marginalised in global cities, I think is a key way of thinking about it. Definitely that flashpoint model, kind of the symbol that symbolises underlying problems for the marginalised and the importance of relations between people in specific localities and the local history and cultures of understanding of what's going on. Certainly the relationships between figures of authority, particularly in the police, and young people play a real, real role in what's going on. Um, but overall, I think, you know, in, again, in that sociological notion of trying to make the normal look strange, Rather than seeing riots as just, you know, violent, spontaneous outbursts that seem to come from nowhere, we need to think um, more deeply and critically about, you know, what an event like that um, actually means, what it symbolises and what maybe the underlying causes of it are. So if you are interested in more uh, research about this, there's been a, a special issue in Thesis 11 that discussed it. There's been an array of articles over the year in the British Journal of Criminology. Um, so you'll be able to find some interesting stuff there. Um, so this is essentially the uh, my last uh, um, last participation in the in the in the course. This is the final week of my four weeks of uh, case study. So um, just you know quickly to try and sum up, um, what I try to do over the, these these four weeks is to um, get a bit of a kind of understanding of what youth studies is. Um, particularly, you know, um, to hopefully encourage uh, students in the course to pursue it more in the future. And there's other courses you can do um, um, in our program, uh, Soccer 3220 in particular, Youth Culture and Risk, and also Consumption Everyday Life, Soccer 3666 covers many of these kind of issues as well. So there's that. Um, I wanted then to kind of, you know, after introducing what youth studies is and why it's important and um, how it can uncover um, many of the kind of key social things that are going on in the world at the moment. I wanted to think a little bit about how the very notion of youth is drawn out in different ways in different parts of society by thinking about them figuratively, um, you know, different ways that youth is drawn upon in media, in politics, and importantly within youth studies itself. Um, in the third week I wanted to um, do a kind of reminder of notions of deviance and then relate that to how young people are kind of uh, positions as often various forms of deviance within 
um, our societies and then use the notion of graffiti as an example to think through some of those implications. Um, and this week I've um, drawn upon um, the notion of violence, uh, violence and riots in particular as a case study to think about how young people are positioned in you know, the political realm and how um, in some ways riots can be seen as a ways for disenfranchised young people to express political dissent. So overall, I, ho I hope you've enjoyed this and um, think uh, hopefully I've helped you think differently and more critically about youth, what it means to be a young person, and um, hopefully you can take some of this stuff forward through um, all of your studies um, throughout the rest of your degree program. Okay, thanks. <laughs>